Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you this morning. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we get into the scriptures together. First of all, I don't know if you care about this or not, but I certainly care about this. Uh, in a month's time, in exactly one month, the days are going to start getting longer. So, just to let you know, there's going to be more sunshine starting in a month's time, and I'm looking forward to that. And of course, Christmas is right around the corner, too. Also, our church has finished collecting Operation uh, Christmas Shoe Child boxes, and we were able to collect 80 of them, 80 shoe boxes. Last year, I believe we only collected 50 and so this year we did 80 and we're very excited about that and I want to thank you uh, to everyone I want to say thank you to everyone who contributed to that thank you uh, for doing that and may the Lord bless you accordingly we're going to get into our chapter here before we do that let's just bow in a word of prayer and commit our time to the Lord Father we thank you that we are able to gather together we thank you for the freedom we have to look into your word and as we do so Lord uh, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. And may we walk away, Lord, changed and transformed by your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel and chapter 19. We're almost two-thirds of the way through the book of 1 Samuel. We've been there for several months, and in sh a short time here, we're going to take a break from 1 Samuel as we do our Christmas series together. 1 Samuel chapter 19. Several years ago, I came across a radio drama series that was uh, written and produced by the same folks who do Adventures in Odyssey, which is a radio program you'll probably be familiar with. And in the one particular episode of this radio series, uh, there is a line that is spoken by a key character in the narrative. And that key character actually happens to be a demon. A demon was a character in this story. And the line that the demon speaks is this, evil corrupts. And then it consumes that which it corrupts. Evil corrupts, and then it consumes that which it corrupts. Now, if the devil or a demon ever says something, you would, of course, have good reason to question it. But in this case, it would seem that there is truth here. Evil corrupts. And then it consumes that which it corrupts. First there is corruption, and then there is consumption, consuming. This is the way sin works in our lives. If left unchecked, if left unchallenged, it will eventually consume us. This is one of the most terrible things that can ever happen to an individual, is where sin consumes. It's like a tiny little spark. A spark can light a small fire. But if that small little fire is left unchecked, unchallenged, it will eventually grow into a raging fire, and there will come a point when that fire becomes out of control. You can't control it anymore. It's now controlling you. Every, um, it's kind of like how every alcoholic has had their first drink. Every, uh, every porn addict had their first glance at a pornographic image. Every uh, habitual liar have at one point told their first lie. And then what was once, what was once a one-time act was willingly committed again and again and again until a habit was formed, until an addiction was the case until an addiction came to be. Evil corrupts, and then it consumes that which it corrupts. And this is the picture that we now have of King Saul. Last week we saw how his heart was corrupted by jealousy. This week uh, we see his jealousy, it's growing like a raging fire within him until it is, it is consuming him. We're going to read verse 1 through to verse 24. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. 
But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his, ser to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night David made good his escape. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't run... For your life tonight, tomorrow, you'll be killed. So Michal led David down through a window, and he fled and escaped. Then Michal took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Michal said, He is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, Bring him to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was an idol in the bed, and at the head was some goat's hair. Saul said to Michal, Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, He said to me, Let me get away. Why should I kill you? When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul, David is in Naoth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying, with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great cistern at Seku. And he asked, Where are Samuel and David? So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments, and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? Previously, it had been Saul's intention to have David killed by the Philistines. And that was why he said, if you want to marry my daughter, you must go, price is that you must go out and get 100 Philistine foreskins and bring them back. And of course, uh, Saul's plan didn't work out the way he was hoping it would. David, instead of bringing back 100 uh, Philistine foreskins, he actually brought 200 foreskins back. He didn't die in the field of battle as Saul was hoping he would. Saul's subtle plan to have David killed, it failed miserably. And with that being the case, Saul's uh, murderous intentions, they become much more open. He becomes much more brazen. The first portion of verse 1, Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. Saul is not keeping his intentions hidden anymore. Those days are now gone. He has become openly hostile toward David. And this is something that no doubt saddens Saul's son, Jonathan. We haven't considered it yet in great detail, though our text last week focused on it a little bit. But Jonathan and David, they have formed a fast friendship. We saw it last week in our text, we see it this week in our text, and next week probably it'll be the focus of uh, the message. The first glimpse of their friendship that we catch is in chapter 18, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. 
David and Jonathan's friendship, it would seem to be very much unusual in the sense that it was incredibly, incredibly strong. And Jonathan doesn't want to see his best friend killed. We wouldn't blame him for that. You wouldn't want to see your best friend killed. And Jonathan doesn't want to see his best friend killed. And he knows David has done nothing wrong. David is innocent. And so he tries to talk to his father. Saul tries to talk with him out of killing uh, tries to talk him out of killing David and he actually succeeds uh, momentarily of course uh, not everyone lives happily ever after here it's not that Saul realizes yeah I was a fool for trying to kill David and I repent of that and that's not going to happen anymore and everyone lived happily ever after that's not the case at all the time of peace in which Saul was not trying to kill David anymore it was very short-lived and before long a familiar incident takes place Saul uh, D David he's playing his instrument and Saul tries pinning him to the wall with a spear it happened uh, in chapter 18 as we saw last week happens again in chapter 19 this week and once again David manages to escape Saul he's not prepared to give up though he's not prepared to give up verse 11 and verse 12 Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning but Michal David's wife warned him if you don't run for your life tonight tomorrow you'll be killed so Michal let David down through a window and he fled and escaped uh, we see here that David he is now on the run he is entering a very dark season of his life. He doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be on the run for a long, long time as Saul refuses to give up his attempts to kill David. David's wilderness journey, it is about to begin. And that's the theme that we're going to pick up later on in our series, the time spent in the wilderness. Michal, David's wife, covered up his escape. She lied to her father to cover up her husband's escape. She lied to him about the reason for letting him escape. And then a most interesting portion of the narrative. Most interesting portion. David escaped to Samuel at Naoth. Word reached Saul of David's location, and he sends men to go there to capture David. Those men don't succeed, though, in capturing David. Instead, they find Samuel and a group of prophets prophesying, and they also start prophesying. The Spirit of God comes upon them, and they start prophesying. Saul, he sends another group of men and they too start prophesying. Then he sends another group of men, and they too start prophesying. And finally, Saul, he's just had enough, and he decides to go himself. Verse 23, So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even on him, and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. A wild, bizarre narrative. What are we to do with it? What spiritual truths are we to extract from it? I have two points for you this morning. Two points. Point number one is the persecution of God's anointed. The persecution of God's anointed. The text does not say this, but David is not having the time of his life here. He's not having a very good time. And we might put our shell, uh, if we are able to put our, ourselves in his shoes for a minute, we would see that. Uh, he's dodging spears. Uh, his new wife, uh, David is, of course, he's a newlywed, and his new wife is letting him down through a window at night so that he doesn't get murdered. Four times in the, over the course of this chapter, the word escape is used, and it's used in reference to David. He's escaping. He's the run. He's being hunted. Not the way you'd want to spend your uh, newlywed life, running for your life. 
David, he might have thought along the way, you know, God, I didn't sign up for this. God, what's going on here? This isn't going very well. Might have even thought to himself, you know, maybe I should just go back to the sheep. Take my new wife and go back to the sheep and forget all of this headache. Shepherding sheep probably be better than being number one on the king's most wanted list. We don't know what's going through David's mind, but it's safe to say he's not having a good time at this point. With that said, when God chose him to be king over Israel, he never promised him a good time. He never told him that everything was going to go perfectly, completely well. And in fact, as I read through Scripture, if you have been called by God, you're not going to have an easy time. The road is probably, almost certainly, going to be rough ahead of you. You're going to be persecuted, as David is being persecuted here by the king. That kind of goes against the modern prosperity gospel thinking of God wants you to have an easy, happy life, and so on and so forth. As I read Scripture, it's simply not the case. As I look through the biographies of the people God used, it's not the case. They walk through incredibly difficult times. Times of persecution. Times of persecution. I think of Moses and uh, his leading the Israelites through the wilderness. He didn't often have a great time doing that. Didn't have a great time doing that. I think of Jeremiah and the persecution he faced. I'm reading through Jeremiah in my devotions right now. At Jeremiah, he was beaten. He was put in the stocks. He was imprisoned. He was thrown in a cistern. At one point, he says, I wish I hadn't have been born. That's a very sad state when you get to a point, when you're so low, when life is so rough that you just simply say, you know, I really wish I had not have been born. That was what Jeremiah said. I think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. He faced a great deal of persecution. He was stoned. He lived through the experience, but he was stoned. Imprisoned, beaten with rods. And he knew what it was like uh, to be on the run, just as David knew what it was like to be on the run. This is from Acts chapter 9, 23 to 25. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. It is very similar, of course, to what Michal did for David, lowered him, uh, lowered him from a window at night. So, Paul, he's uh, Saul who became Paul, he's no stranger to persecution here. And as God's chosen vessel, uh, he suffered. He suffered greatly at the hands of other people. This was actually foretold. These are the words of the Lord to Ananias. Acts, 19, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 17. This man is my chosen instrument to, to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul was chosen by God. And uh, as was going to be a part of that whole package, you know, a suffering was going to be in there. Suffering was to be expected. He was going to face persecution. He could bank on it. And there is, of course, no greater example of suffering at the hands of persecutors than Jesus Christ himself. John 15, verse 18, these are the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And people did hate Jesus. On multiple occasions, they sought to kill him, just as King Saul is seeking to kill David. And eventually, the difference is, is that eventually those who hated Jesus did kill him, which was, of course, part of God's sovereign plan. This uh, intense level of persecution is a bit foreign to us here in North America. In other countries where people do not possess the religious freedoms uh, that we have here, 
it is not uncommon for the Christians, for those who are chosen by God, uh, to be hunted down and killed, just as Saul was trying to hunt down David and kill him. We experience here in North America a much milder form of persecution, which may not always be the case. The day may come where, and it will likely come, where that persecution that we are experiencing even now is very much intensified. Uh, to the point that we may know what it's like to be in the Apostle Paul's shoes, or even in David's shoes. As it is right now, we often suffer mockery. Uh, we may suffer scorn. The apologist Ravi Zacharias, he wrote this in one of his books. Attack has been leveled against Christianity as Eastern religions enjoy a patronizing nod and the protection of mystical license. As for Islam, no university dares offend. Hand in hand with this unmasked intellectual cowardice and concealed duplicity came mockery and ridicule of the Christian, which has now become commonplace, a quote-unquote civilized form of torture. Now, whatever form or whatever degree of persecution that we may experience in this world that we may find ourselves facing, we should not be surprised by it. It is to be expected. This may seem rather dark and gloomy when we consider the persecution uh, that uh, that we are told we will likely experience. The world is going to hate you. Uh, but there is good news. There is good news. And this brings us to point number two. Point number two, the protection of God's anointed. The protection of God's anointed. Saul did, not uh, Saul did not succeed in killing David. And he never would either. He was never, although he tried and tried and tried, he would never succeed in killing David. And the reason was because God did not want David to be killed. It is that simple. And therefore, God protected him from the murderous attacks of King Saul. And we see this mainly in the latter portion of the chapter that we have been looking at here. When Saul sends men to capture David. Verse 20. So he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophes prophesied. Three times men come to capture David. And three times they failed. Then Saul comes prepared to capture David himself. I once had a boss, and he told me often, he'd say, Luke, if you want a job done, you got to get it, you have to do it yourself. You want a job done right, you got to do it yourself. Well, Saul goes to do the job right, he goes to do it himself, and uh, it doesn't work. Saul fails too. Reason being, God's hand of protection is upon David. God is watching over David, and no harm would come to him unless God had willed it, and he hadn't. And as God's chosen people, the same applies for us. He is watching over us. With that said, we do need to be careful. We need to be careful because believers are not immune from persecution, from death even, at the hand of persecutors, at the hand of those who hate them. Christians are not promised that that will never happen. And this presents us with a bit of an interesting paradox, actually. What do we make of this? On one hand, we have the words of the psalmist from chapter 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's on one hand. On the other hand, the prophets were killed. Stephen was stoned. Paul, he was martyred. 
the 11 of the 12 apostles suffered martyrs' deaths. And so the big question is, how are we to reconcile the fact that God protects His children, He looks out for His children, He cares for His children, with the fact that we will face persecution in one form or another, to some level, to some degree or another. It may be simple mockery and scorn, or it may be imprisonment as Jeremiah experienced, as Paul experienced. It may be martyrdom. This is a good question. This is a great question. How do we reconcile this? Two answers I leave you with in closing. Two answers I leave you with. Number one is this. No harm will come to you. No harm will come to you unless and until God in His sovereignty allows it. The reason no harm came to David by the hand of King Saul was because God in His sovereignty did not want David to be harmed, and therefore He did not allow Saul to harm him. This is actually the same with Jesus. We see the same thing happening with Jesus. This is John chapter 7, verse 28 to 30. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him. And then here's the point. But no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. They tried to seize him, but they were kept from doing so, ultimately by the sovereign hand of God, because Jesus' time had not yet come. The time had not yet come for them to put him to death. This is all operating on the Father's timetable. And it is according to His sovereign will that Jesus was not harmed at this point. No harm will come to you unless and until God in His sovereignty allows it. Now this truth, uh, this truth that no harm will come to us unless and until God allows it, it is, um, it is comforting Somewhat comforting anyway, anyways. Uh, it would be disconcerting if there were no God watching over us, uh, no God running the show, and anything could go wrong at any point in time for no reason whatsoever. That would be very frightening. On the other hand, the sovereignty of God, insofar as suffering is concerned, insofar as allowing persecution is concerned, it is... It is comforting in one sense. In another, though, it's not the most comforting of doctrines because it doesn't outrule the possibility of bad things happening to us. It doesn't outrule that possibility. R.C. Sproul, he made this point in his Romans commentary. He makes it rather humorous. He writes this, My late friend James Boyce and I frequently flew together to various conferences and events. I am a white knuckle flyer, whereas he loved the bumps and the feeling of exhilaration that comes from flying through the air. While I looked anxiously out the window, he said, What is the matter, R.C.? Don't you believe in the sovereignty of God? I replied, Jim, that is my problem. I do believe in the sovereignty of God, and I know that He would be perfectly just to crash me into the ocean right now. That is why I am nervous. God, He is sovereign. God, He does care for us. He watches over us as He did David. But we still may end up in prison, as Jeremiah, as Paul did. What comfort do we have in the face of that reality? And that leads me to my second thought that I leave you with. All things work for good. All things work for good. And if we could get this into our bloodstream, I believe this to a large extent anyways, maybe not completely, but to a large extent, we would find great peace and comfort here. Romans 8.28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. That all things would include the bad things, the suffering, the persecution, 
The bad things that David experienced, he's out there running around in the wilderness. He's going to be for quite some time. That all works together for good. God uses it for good. We don't know why bad things happen to us sometimes. Even David, he sometimes wondered what God was doing, where he was, where his hand of protection was, because it would seem to have vanished and be gone. No doubt Joseph, he was thinking about all these things when he was sold into slavery by his brothers, when he was sitting in that Egyptian jail. And it wasn't until years down the road, years down the road, he could look back and he could see, as Paul said, God causes all things to work together for good. Well, we don't know why. Oh, but our hope is in the truth of this verse. That if God should ever allow physical harm to come to us, it's because He has a reason. God in His infinite sovereignty, His infinite wisdom he, had, wisdom, he has a reason and a purpose for allowing that to happen. He will use it for our good. R.C. Sproul, in writing on this topic, he said this in regards to Romans 8.28, Paul does not say here that all things that happen to us are good things. In fact, bad things happen to us, painful things, things that crush our spirits, things that leave wounds and scars, things that evoke grief and lead us into the house of mourning. Yet all of these bad things that happen to us are working together for our good. This is to say that ultimately it is good that these things happen to us. I believe that bad things do happen to us. Whether it be at the hands of persecutors, as David, he's, uh, that's what he's experiencing. He's experiencing bad things at the hands of King Saul. I believe that the time will eventually come, whether on this side of eternity, this side of death, or in heaven, uh, we will be able to say... As the psalmist said, and I leave you with this verse, Psalm 119, 71, It was good for me to be afflicted. It was good for me to be afflicted. I leave that with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. And Lord, as we wrestle with this very difficult subject. Because we don't know why, Lord, we sometimes suffer. And those who have gone before us who have suffered, Lord, who suffered greatly for you, uh, they may, they, they probably didn't know ultimately why you were allowing it to happen. Uh, but God, help us to put our lives into your hands. Help us to remember, Lord, that you know what's best. Help us to remember that all things work together for good. You know what you're doing, Lord. And you love us. And you're going to do what's best for us. May we hold on to that reality. As David probably had to hold on to that reality too during the difficult times that we find him walking through right now. Be with us as we go from here. Guide and direct us this week, we pray, Lord. Amen.